This is the entrance to the government headquarters in Bastes in Kitsnevis. It was on these steps, on the evening of 18th June 1981, that the representatives of seven Eastern Caribbean governments signed the treaty that established the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS. The Treaty of Bastes created an organization whose supreme policy-making institution was a council of heads of government of the member states called the Authority and a secretariat with a director general and two directors. These officials, together with the seven signatories to the Treaty of Bastes and the first prime ministers of the authority, were the founders of the OECS, those who laid the foundation for an organization which 35 years later has become an essential part of governance in the Eastern Caribbean. In observance of the 35th anniversary of the OECS on 18th June 2016, the OECS Commission presents the series, The OECS, The Founders, which tells the story of the first five years of the organization through the memories of five of the founding leaders still with us. In this program, Swinburne Lestrade. Swinburne Lestrade was the first director of the Economic Affairs Secretariat of the OECS. A national of Dominica, born in October 1947, and an economist by profession, he went on to become the second director general of the OECS from 1996 to 2000. He also held another position at the OECS, that of the first executive director of its Washington-based agency, the Eastern Caribbean Investment Promotion Services, ISIPS, from 1987 to 1990. Following his tenure at the OECS, he served in various capacities with the government of Dominica, including its ambassador to the OES and the USA. In November 2004, he was awarded Dominica's second highest national honor, the Cicero Award of Honor. Mr. Lestrade is currently a freelance consultant owning a Dominican registered firm, Quiet Consulting and Research, KCR. We began by recalling how he became Director of the Economic Affairs Secretariat, known as the EAS, and what had prompted him to accept the offer. My interest in integration goes way back. Um, it goes back at least to my years on the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies, where we were, those of us, small number at the time, were really quite active. We were promoting the islands that we came from to a country that really, and to a campus that didn't know much about the islands at all. So that was part of the... And that was Mona? Mona. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the early motivation to, you know, to get, to get busy promoting the the Windwards and Leewards. We actually formed an association. It is called the Windward Leeward Students Association of the, of the Mona campus. And I was very active in getting that going. Interesting, well, I just recall now, one of the things that we did was, as part of exposing that region, I don't like to say sub-region, <laughs> it's the OECS region, to, the, uh, to Jamaica, we organized an expo, a trade exposition. And uh, we organized to bring products of the islands up to, to Jamaica. Jamaica. And we organized a week-long uh, exposition, which went quite well. And it was supported by some islanders, if you like, as we were called then, who were resident in Jamaica. You know, there were a couple of lawyers and guys who were able to lend some financial support to the proposal and to, the, and to its execution. So yes, my interest began way back then. That was when, that was the 70s? 60s, 70s? Late 60s, early 70s. Uh, people like Dwight Venner were around and, and so on. And talking about Dwight Venner, and to bring us right home to this, to this subject, Dwight Venner, Ralph Gonzales, myself, yeah. Vaughn Lewis, I think in the There's early a, 70s, was a Marsha, 72. Bernard Marshall. Bernard Marshall. From the group too. That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. We got the uh, then extramural department under Rex Nettleford to sponsor a trip through the Windwards and Leewards. We went to every one of them. 
and we were talking almost every night, either in lectures, discussions, you know, town hall type meetings, promoting the integration of the windmills and leaguers. That was in the early 70s. <laughs> so, <laughs> so truly the interest was there uh, from then on. In fact, the products of that exercise are published in, a, in an issue of Caribbean Quarterly. Yes, I think I've seen yeah, that. Yeah. So, you know, I've been with integration for a long time. And I believe I was first alerted to the opening of this job position. I think it's Alistair McIntyre. But I wouldn't want anyone to hold me to that. But I'm, I was trying to remember how I first, but, mm -hmm. and I think somebody, and it might have been Alistair McIntyre. So where were you at the time when the treaty was signed? At the time the treaty was signed, I was in London. I was at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Okay. But it took a long time, as tends to happen, to make things happen. And in the meantime, I took up a position at the Caribbean Association of Industry and Commerce. So it's from CAIC that I left to go to Antigua. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's how I became interested. And that's how it happened. And the, the EAS, as we, it was called, basically took over the running of the what has been then the East Caribbean Common Market, which was Se integrated into the, the, the Treaty of Bass there That's as correct. an annex. That's correct. And, uh, but the ECCM, as you would know, was, had been around for about 13 to 14 years, but had been fairly... Yeah, from about 68, 9. Right. Yeah. About 60, from 68. It was yeah. one of the first acts yeah. of the then Wiser Council. Mm -hmm. But it had not had a had high profile. It had been not considered fairly dormant. The, the, a lot of the provisions of the common market treaty had not been activated after 13 years. In that context, what was your approach? Well, when I got to ECCM, and that squares with what you're saying, the focus really was on trade issues. It was really on arguing our case, our meaning, the Windward, Windward and Leeward Islands. I say OECS, mm -hmm. although OECS yeah. didn't happen yet, but for convenience. It was really arguing the case of the OECS Islands before the CARICOM, CARICOM. Council of Ministers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was a defensive kind of posture. Mm -hmm. We had industries to protect, mm -hmm. even as we wanted to get more industries established, even as we wanted, you know, protection for those industries so they could grow, so they could, you know, fulfill the objectives of growth, employment, uh, you know, and, and so on. And it was a small office. When I got to Antigua, which is, of course, where the ECM secretary was located, I met really an old, <laughs> a set of old ramshackle looking buildings. So, they, so that the office had no stature, not even within Antigua itself. And uh, the staffing, of course, was woefully inadequate. Productivity was really very low, guys. I mean, the office, I don't know who's going to see that, but the office <laughs> was really a place where government ministers send people for jobs, you know, kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. So that, the, I mean, there was no seriousness of approach to the staffing, to the staffing complement, you know, to the substantive staffing of the... Although Antigua, I remember in 74, when they signed on to CARICOM, was saying that they wanted the ECCM to be a fifth block in CARICOM and be a buffer. Correct, correct. Well, that, in <laughs> fact, had been its posture. <laughs> and um, had been the practice, if you like, of the, and had been the mindset of the governments mm. and of the secretariat. So inevitably, we had to continue some of that because, you know, one was not breaking completely with what went on before. One wanted to make for an evolution, albeit an accelerated evolution of the profile, of the purposes, mm. of the modus operandi of the, of the office. So one of the initial things I had to do was really decide whether I had a staffing that was <laughs> adequate to what I wanted to do. So early on, I found myself in controversy with the Antigua government, because obviously some persons there just, I mean, <laughs> they had to go. They had to be rotated out of the place and all that. So that, 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 was, a, that was a big effort, and it was politically charged, because, uh, you know, I found an office there that was heavily influenced by the Antigua government and certain ministers in particular. Mm -hmm and hiring and firing decisions almost informally had to come under the, the scrutiny and had to receive the imprimatur of the, of, the, of the administration. But I think I did that successfully enough. Okay, but we had to expand the staffing, we had to recruit new staff, I had to, I had to, I had to persuade the governments to you know, give me a salary level 
that was you know commensurate with responsibilities and all that. Mm -hmm. So a big part of the early job was administrative. Mm -hmm. Substantively, I also wanted to expand beyond trade issues. A large part of what we did was monitor and make recommendations relating to the then allocation of industries Industry. scheme, mm -hmm. which was still in operation, but which really never worked well. Yeah, I'll come to that in a while. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, okay, yeah, well, yeah. I can leave that then. Mm -hmm. So we expanded into the area of fiscal policy, uh, tax administration, budget, budgeting issues, yeah? issues of, of, of national budgeting. And we did that via a, pro a project. We got USAID to fund the project. Um, I forget what it was called. It was called an economic management project, something like that. Mm -hmm. And we had two experts, you know, to come with that. At the time, <clears throat> I had my fiscal advisor, Fitz Francis, mm -hmm. who was there. So he was able to work closely with that. And we, we did quite a, some good work in the islands in terms of fiscal so, harmonization. So in a sense, you were starting to have an impact yeah. on the islands in terms of the economic yes. oh, definitely. Um, um, management, in terms of economic management definitely. in those countries. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And on the monetary side, we developed a, a close, closer working relationship with the, with the, with the central bank. Mm -hmm. Of course, it wasn't the central bank then, it was the Eastern currency, Carrier, authority. currency authority. One of the, the issues you just mentioned was the industrial allocation scheme, which was a holdover from the Wiser Council days and part of the East Caribbean Common Market. That scheme withered away finally yeah. in 1986. Yeah, it has never Can you killed. Tell us it has never killed. It withered, the, away. withered away. Can you tell us how it was meant to operate, how in fact it operated, and what led to its demise? Okay, the scheme was intended to take account of the small size of our markets among countries that were all seeking industrialization. At the time, in fact, development was almost synonymous with industrialization, yeah? quite apart from the banana issue there. But one had to diversify, one had to industrialize. Yet, all markets were too small, really, to accommodate a number of competing enterprises in the same sector, or in, in some cases, in the same product line. So what do you do? You guarantee an enterprise in one of the islands that it would have the entire market of all the islands for its products. Mm. And to guarantee that, you had to preclude the other, the islands. other islands from establishing the same enterprise. Mm -hmm. Because you couldn't accommodate, that was the thinking at the time, you couldn't accommodate more than one. For example, soaps in Dominica. Mm -hmm. Dominica was allocated soaps. That came easily and actually because Dominica already had, had some tradition. Yeah. Uh, in soap manufacture, but take um, beer manufacturing. <laughs> beer, beer was so problematic. <laughs> <laughs> but take galvanized in uh, Saint Vincent. Saint Vincent was allocated galvanized sheets, galvanized sheeting, and flour. Yeah. Saint Vincent was allocated flour. Flour, yes. Saint Vincent yes. Was allocated flour. Or was it Saint Lucia and Saint Vincent set up? Yeah. That's why I hesitated. <laughs> Saint Lucia yeah. was allocated flour. Right. Okay. But St. Vincent went ahead and established a, a flour mill, and that was the first real threat to that allocation scheme. So the thinking, as I was saying earlier, derived to some extent from the a kind of a central planning mentality, although they would not have called it that at the time. But the rationale was really small size of market to maximize the opportunity and the potential for industrialization on the islands. Inevitably, of course, and the products would also be protected from competition from the wider Caribbean Caricom. region. Yeah. Because we also had Article 56, I think before it was Article 29 or something, mm -hmm. under Carifta. Carifta, yeah. Jesus. And, <laughs> okay. and Article 56 under Caricom. Under Caricom. <laughs> which countries, which, which the LDCs at the time, we will call the lesser developed countries, the OECS countries, we could uh, invoke mm -hmm. that particular article to protect all markets from competition, from products from the rest of the Caribbean, from the rest of the CARICOM. So, you know, they, they all worked in tandem, yeah? In time, of course, countries did not adhere to the scheme. Flora is a very good example. When St. Vincent found that uh, it was in a position to establish a serious flora 
operation, and it did. At the time, there were hordes of protest from all the islands. In time, the protests died off, especially as that mill began to operate rather successfully, whereas I'm not sure in Saint if Lucia, the St. Lucia one ever no, got what established. Happened, um, the St. Lucia operation was blown down by Hurricane Allen oh. in 1980. Oh. So, all right. So it, and it was never revived. Right. Given the competition, I Correct. suppose, from St. Vincent. Correct. Because, yeah. And beer, I think, you know, we know the story of beer. Every country wants its own brewery. Every country you now has, its, has own its own brewery. brewery. <laughs> <laughs> and so on. I think beer was allocated to Grenada. Either Grenada or St. Kitts. Yeah. But it was allocated to one country. It's to one country. <laughs> okay. So basically, the scheme withered away because the integrity of the scheme was never respected. It was never adhered to. You could say perhaps the scheme in the end had lost its integrity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And in time, nobody talked about it anymore, and the issue just did not come up again. It came up, in a sense, residually in the context of Article 56 of CARICOM. Because every now and again, a member country would invoke Article 56 because it wanted to protect something, yes? And uh, implicitly, because when CARICOM takes a decision to apply Article 56, it does that for the entire region, mm -hmm. okay? For the entire there OECS yeah. sub-region. Yeah. Yeah. So implicitly, the product that was granted 56 was allocated, quote unquote, to, to the, the, the particular the, country making the application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that tended to, to apply for a while until some of the country decided it was also in a position to benefit from 56 in the same product. And, and that was allowed to happen because they were no, you know, as I said, they all, all own scheme had no integrity. Mm -hmm. So in the end, no surprise that it, and the thinking changed as well, don't forget. I mean, we began to think more liberally about, you know, you less went, fair economics. You went away from central planning. Liberal <laughs> economics and all yeah. that, you know, the free enterprise system mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So thinking changed as well, and um, there was no way we were going to go back to an allocation scheme. One of the constant and vexing difficulties that Lestrade and other OECS directors had to contend with was the failure of member governments to promptly pay their subscriptions to the organization. As a result, its offices were often starved for funds. As you look back, why were the governments um, so frugal in hmm. their, in their uh, I use the word frugal in the sense that they were, one would think they were, they were looking at the pennies, so others would say that. Why were they not more supportive financially of the integration institutions? Is it a lack of resources or a lack of pri or, or, or setting the wrong priorities? Well, they would say a lack of resources. But you know, I have always been keen to emphasize to staff I worked with that really we have to ex understand that the government's first priorities have to be national. their respective islands. They have to be national. Uh, I was always very keen on that. I was also very keen on showing to the, to the heads that really we were making good use of the money, that we were not wasting the money, that we were keeping our operation as tight as possible, as lean as possible, and so on. I remember, for example, staff, putting, staff wanting a salary increase um, at the time, which I thought was deserved. But I forget, I mean, if they asked for 10, I cut it down to five. And one of my biggest disappointments <laughs> was, having made such a great effort to, to keep the thing down, it was still turned on by the government. That was, that was one of my low points in the Secretariat. But I think the governments could have done better. Miss um, Charles of late has an expression, where my eyes fall first. That's where the money goes. <laughs> their eyes fell first on their own public services, on their own national priorities, and so on. One had to understand that. But I think it is fair to say that I'm not sure to how many of our governments integration was a clear priority, really. I'm not sure if you press them, you know, hard, they would have it in them to admit, to admit that. But it really was not a strong priority for the governments. It was almost a residual <laughs> consideration, if that's not too strong a term. But really, I think that was a part of the, of, the, of the reason. It doesn't apply to all of them, to all the heads at the time. 
And of course, what I'm saying has a lot to do with who was the particular head of government at the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think, for example, to people like John Compton, mm -hmm. I think integration was a priority. But having mentioned John Compton, I must also mention, which perhaps might indicate one of the practical difficulties of operating at the national level, it is that there was one meeting when we were discussing the, the Secretary's budget. St. Lucia was heavily in the red. Then Prime Minister Compton went into, I don't know, a six-minute <laughs> tirade almost, attacking his finance officials. For not, for not, for for not, not paying the secretary. <laughs> <laughs> it was, that was a hell of a moment. His words were, the boys downstairs. Yes. The boys downstairs, okay? Mm -hmm. And the whole meeting was looking at each other, perplexed. I mean, he was a finance minister. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so, I mean, there were, there were all kinds of issues. One time, the Dominican Prime Minister, Ms. Charles, for example, was making the point that they were then under an IMF program. You might remember in the early 80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it went on for about six years, I think. So we have to, about 85, 86. And uh, one of the elements of that program was wage, wage rest freeze. restrictions. Mm -hmm. Okay, wage freeze and hiring freeze. So, and the public service was to have been reduced from, through natural waste stage. Mm -hmm. And we had to understand she could not, in that context, context. be approving a salary increase for secretary yes. staff. Mm -hmm. So you had those kinds of complications. There were always national issues that raised their heads, uh, sometimes in conflict with you know, regional objectives and regional purposes or secretariat uh, interests, secretariat interests and so on. So it was... It was an exciting time, but it was <laughs> difficult. It had its ups and downs. There was a recommendation or, um, at one point to try to solve the economic or financial woes of the secretariats, of the secretariats, and it was one secretariat in two locations, by um, allocating profits from the central bank. Oh, yes. So you had an automatic deduction from your profits, and yeah. that didn't fly. Yeah. It it was around for maybe two years mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, a, as an idea, yeah. a proposal. Mm -hmm. I think some technical work was done on it, but it was, it was found not to be feasible because, well, priorities. Mm -hmm. A number of governments simply wanted their profits to come directly to them mm -hmm. or to go into a special reserve that the central bank had, a, a B reserve, they call it, you know, for, for emergency purposes and so on. There was another proposal that the central bank pays directly Debit governments <laughs> comes <laughs> that was not accepted, and there was a proposal to pay out of uh, to add to pay out of import duties mm -hmm. collected import revenue collected. I think now, if we can fast forward to today, mm -hmm. I think that there is such a proposal that has finally been accepted. Oh, okay. I think yes, an additional tax mm -hmm. or an additional percentage to be added to the import tariff of particular items, either external trade, non caricom trade, whatever. I don't have it down part right now. But mm -hmm. I think in the last, within the last year, okay. some such proposal has been So accepted. finally after 30 something, something years. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. And I, I, I suppose when you, you later became director of the Director General of the Secretariat, and you still had that problem of, oh, of yes. financing. Oh, yes. Very much so. Mm -hmm. In the context of the financial constraints under which the OECS Secretariat operated, support from international organizations like the UNDP was critical. So they were able to supply some key personnel, some experts in particular areas. Mm -hmm. um, they are the ones so, who funded the economic advisor, Fitz Francis, that mm -hmm. I mentioned. Mm -hmm. They funded him for about four years as a secretariat okay. and all that. And a part of what we did as well was talking about UNDP was really to, to forge cooperation arrangements with a number of institutions and donor agencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did really well with USAID, with UNDP, with the World Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those three certainly. So, come in to fact, mind. you mentioned earlier on the um, fact that ECTA suffered from a lack of financial support and uh, the Secretariat as a whole also experience uh, yeah. droughts of, uh, so that um, the relationships with 
organizations like UNDP, USAID were critical, you would say, for critical. the survival of the, of the Secretariat? Critical. Mm -hmm. Critical, if not survival, certainly the, 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 the functioning, the effectiveness of the office, you know, the scope of operations, certainly, um, you know. I mean, OECS as a whole would have been only half as effective as it's been without donor support. That's another dis that's for another discussion. But I have a view. I have a cynical <laughs> view. Of that. But but if if the if the the governments I as mean, a whole, I mean, you, the, you point the, you point to anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is not the central bank, of course. All right. But really, we deserve we the islands mm -hmm. or people or governments deserve credit for for having kept the central bank going. But it did not the central bank nor the authority, its predecessor, did not necessarily derive from an, a, a sense of vision, a sense of purpose, okay? a sense of determining where you want to go and how we, how we want to get there, and the fact that the bank, the authority, might have been a key part of that process. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying, therefore, that the central bank, in a sense, survival long, longevity had more to do with what it, what it, what it was, yeah. rather than yeah. the, 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 the authority saying, this is what, where we want right. to go. A vision. And giving it the support that it required. A vision for union, mm -hmm. or political, not to mention political, political union, or even economic union. It didn't come out of such a vision, mm -hmm. is, is, really, is, is really what I'm saying. In 1987, you left the OECS and um, headed ESIPS in Washington. Uh, can you recall why you left OECS? So is that a question I should ask? To go to an institution I was, in a sense, subordinate to the years, because, uh, uh, or is that not something you want to? I left to? OECS, frankly, a little prematurely. Mm -hmm. I, I hinted earlier at the fact that I was often at loggerheads with governmental authorities mm -hmm. because I was very resistant to attempts to interfere. Mm -hmm. politically with the work of the office. All right. I survived what? I survived about six years there. So eventually, things got personal, after which I just said, you know, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. But well, only after that was an approach made by one or two ministers to ask me to go to ESIPS. I had, obviously, from my position, I had been involved in the, you know, yeah, ESIPS to some extent, was familiar and all that and so on. And I was asked to go there. ESIPS, in fact, um, turned out to be a, a very great success within its first two years. Um, can you tell us how it worked, what ESIPS was about? Okay, ESIPS again began as a project. It was fully funded at the start by USAID, mm -hmm. fully funded. Um, can you just give us what ESIPS meant? Eastern Caribbean Investment Promotion Service. Yeah, Eastern Caribbean Investment Promotion Service. Prior to that, USAID had funded certain individuals. I think one of them was Owen LaRock, mm. <laughs> if I recall correctly, um, who operated out of New York, mm -hmm. doing a limited yeah, amount of investment promotion. Until the governments persuaded them, hell, let's go the whole hog and establish an institution that we would locate on the US mainland to attract US investors uh, to do business in the Caribbean. Yeah, and um, no, that that was that ESIPS became that <laughs> that 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 concept. So I went up to Washington. I mean, you have no idea. Much as I had to spend a lot of time establishing the office in Antigua. <laughs> yeah. Similarly, I mean, there was nothing in Antigua. In in Washington. You, in Washington, so. you had to start by looking for office space. Mm -hmm. Walking down the road and pick up a couple <laughs> of telephones, and that's literally how the thing got established. It was always a small operation. Um, the staff consisted of the executive director, and we essentially had two investment promotion offices and a data uh, computer, computer, an IT man, ICT man, and so on. And essentially, we organized promotional seminars uh, to some identified states, you know, all over the U.S. and so on. Uh, we liaised with, uh, well, you know, Washington is full of consultants. That's right. And every one of them will promise you that they'll flood your country with, uh, with <laughs> investors and so on. And they get to know you around. 
long before you get to know of them. So a lot of the time was taken up with meeting or warding off, um, you know, potential consultants looking for business and all that. Everybody has their, you know, big promise, a big portfolio yeah. of potential investors. So much of the time was, I spent three years there, and uh, much of the time was spent attending trade fairs, organizing trade fairs, doing promotional seminars, you know, picking up leads and following through on them and so on and so on. And we were, you know, these were the days of CBI, mm -hmm. you might remember. Yeah. And we were able to attract a number of garment operations, garment assembly operations, I think St. Lucia got one. Yeah. Electronics assembly operations, St. Kitts featured there more prominently than anybody else. And Grenada had some data entry and so on. Not all the islands did as well, mm -hmm. but certainly those three I mentioned, uh, you know, did quite satisfactorily. You know who one of my investment promotion officers was? Anton Edmonds, no? Oh, Anton, Anton, was, came, Anton, Anton came, came later. Afterwards. Okay. I'm talking about Alan Chastney. Oh, he was, he worked in his hips? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I recruited him. He was one of the, one of the investment promotion officers. Mm -hmm. The functioning of the, of the authority and the functioning of the, the ES Council of Ministers, what were your views or what are your views on how they operated in terms of, of keeping the organization going, pushing um, and, and the OSS? I mean, there's not much to, to say there. I mean, I mean, there were no conflicts, first of all. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the authority is the superior body. Mm -hmm. So issues that couldn't be resolved at the Economic yes. Affairs Council yes. level would be taken up to the, uh, to the authority. But that did not happen often. Mm -hmm. I think in those days, really, the council functioned pretty well, pretty satisfactorily. People attended meetings. We didn't have a huge problem getting guys to, to come to meetings. meetings. But much has to do with the secretariat. You have to drive this thing. You have to put issues before, before you have to take initiative. You don't wait on them for, you know. And, um, and you have to research your issues well, because ministers can be quite dismissive mm -hmm. of papers <laughs> that come before them that they think inadequate in some way. I can talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Secretary has a big responsibility on their shoulders to ensure that those things. And they have to be well organized in terms of, you know, you know the basics. Mm -hmm. Starting the me meeting on time, having the room well dressed. You know, you, you know, you know, kind of thing. So uh, you have to impress the, the, the guys, the guys that way. So you would say but the secretariat was key to, in a sense, the early success, if one can say that way, of the OECS in terms of I keeping the organization so. together. I would think it was critical. Mm -hmm. No, I would think that it was it was critical. Remember, these were the heady days of um, of trade, 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 trade issues trade. arising. Mm -hmm. These are the heady days of OECS, in a sense, versus CARICOM. CARICOM. Mm -hmm. We would have to prepare issues and to go and argue them and sometimes defend them or advocate, as the case might be, before the wider CARICOM forum. Staffing is critical. We had a guy called Percival Marie. He was very critical in some of those processes I'm talking about, especially in terms of the trade issues and so on, and um, arguing issues before the CARICOM forum. Mm -hmm. And not just what we had at the Secretariat, but you had some key individuals also in country. Mm -hmm. In Solution, you had a guy called Laura. Mm -hmm. You know, in Rock, Dominica, yeah. we had La Rock, although he came a little later on, mm -hmm. you know, we had, you know, mm -hmm. so, so, you know, we had some key individuals around in the islands at the time, and we were all singing from the same hymn sheet, basically, okay, mm -hmm. and working well with the Secretariat and all that. I mean, people can tell you about CARICOM in those days. I mean, the OECS was a very strong, a very strong force within uh, CARICOM. Within CARICOM. Mm -hmm. We had some, we had some bulldog ministers as well, like like you mentioned, Hugh Marshall. Marshall yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, <laughs> and we had not quite bulldog, but gentler, <laughs> but forceful types like like George Mallet, like George Mallet, <laughs> you know, and so on. So I don't know. At the time, I can't say it's not happening. No, maybe I'm just not aware. Mm -hmm. But at the time, we were, we had a pretty cohesive group of ministers, technocrats, yes. secretariat, all pulling together mm -hmm. in the same direction and arguing the case. So there was a sense of force. a of a community, an Eastern Caribbean yes, community. I, I would think so. Mm -hmm. I would think so. Much of what we did as well, you know, remember we had at the time this World Bank group called um, CGCD, yeah. the Caribbean Group for Cooperation and Economic yeah. Development. Then it was really very vibrant. It was still fairly new. Mm -hmm. uh, the Secretariat had the responsibility to prepare OECS positions on some of the issues. And in fact, a whole lot of the issues had to do with the OECS. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think we did rather well within that forum. I think we gained the respect of the, of, the, of the international community and so on. But I think generally, as we said before, it was a pretty cohesive unit. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we all talked about the same issues. We felt the same way on you know some of the issues, mainly the CARICOM mm -hmm. and other external issues and all that. And we had a good complement of technocrats working, working on the issue. It is now 35 years since the treaty was signed, and probably OECS is a maybe a different organization now than. How yeah. much do you think those early years, those first five years that we've been looking at, contributed to what the OECS is today? I'd say they did contribute. After all. I think what we're saying, although OECS might in some ways be different now, the process has been one of evolution, I think. Mm -hmm. And what we did in those early days was lay the foundations, was lay the foundations, get guys accustomed to cooperating. Mm -hmm. I have not been happy with the extent of the cooperation. And it's something, you see, it's a different organization. In some ways, it remains the same. What do I mean by that? One of my complaints has been the absence of a forum where you discuss economic issues. Which is that forum? I don't mean trade issues. Mm -hmm. I don't mean central banking issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. Economic policy issues. Things that one country, one island may have tried that either worked or did not work. Mm -hmm. You share experiences, you share best practices, you share worst practices. Mm -hmm. Okay. You exchange information and you try to learn from each other. The only forum we have for this now is the Monetary Council. Mm -hmm. But really, it's focused to it's monetary. monetary yeah. It's a lot narrower than, mm -hmm. okay, than what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. At the EAS in the 80s, we tried to do something about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had that, that There was something called feed. the Economic Policy Thank Review. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. it's coming to. Mm -hmm. Okay, to fill that gap, we established the Economic Policy Review Committee, Committee. ETRC. And that worked quite well for a while. Mm -hmm. For a number of years, it worked quite well. And that was the forum. But I don't know what happened after 1987. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was never convened. So I still see that as a lacuna in our setup, in our arrangements. There's the absence of such a body. Guys are making important decisions at home, you know. Something that was tried, I mean, I saw it, for example, in Dominica, um, where, we, where we had a stabilization program. We had a pretty serious economic and fiscal crisis there. Okay, we went through it. Grenada's turn comes to do a debt restructuring. There's no phone call in the phone to him. Hey, guys, come now, let's talk. Mm -hmm. You know, let's talk. <laughs> so kids went through its own. And we always tend to go for external mm -hmm. bodies, external support, external assistance. Fine, you can get it. But you might still be in a position to benefit from the experience of one or two other countries. Mm -hmm. In fact, there should be a regular forum. The EPRC used to meet twice a year. Mm -hmm. OK, it was basically the financial secretaries and the heads of planning yeah. of the islands. All right. Mm -hmm. All right? And, um, and, you know, and our deliberations could then feed into policy at respective national levels or at a, at a regional level, as the case may be. There's no such forum right now. And I, I, don't, I don't understand it. I don't. Finally, how do you feel about your contribution to the organization? And do you consider yourself a founding father, as we have named you? Yeah, I took objection to being called <laughs> founding father, actually. <laughs> Because you're founding father in the sense of yes. the people who were there at the beginning, at the beginning. who, who yeah, yeah. established this organization. Yeah, I can understand that. And whose that. story we needed to hear their perspectives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to, to, to share the experiences of the time, you know. Um, there was that vision. You look at the, you look at the Treaty of Bastet, well, the original Treaty of there, <laughs> And we tend to put things in treaties that we just don't think about afterwards. Yeah. Looking back, I think you had some persons in Dr. Vaughan Lewis and myself in particular who had this early vision for Caribbean integration. It's what got us into OECS. We didn't go into OECS because there was a job going. Job. <laughs> okay. It was, and I totally began way back on the Mona campus. And um, Rav Gonzalez, for example, I could argue, you know, uh, shared, shares, shared <laughs> that vision, you know, and so on, because we were all in that thing together. So we were committed. I used to tell my staff at OECS that working at OECS is not a job, you know. It's really not just a matter of having a job, you know, it's, it's really sharing and pursuing a vision. I used to make a point with them all the time. And um, I, think we'd, we, I think we made a difference. I mean, look at the, look at the office in St. Lucia, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have that there now because of a very difficult decision to close down the <laughs> interior <laughs> office. <laughs> <laughs> and to, and to, which also. Uh, didn't why, be, why, why we didn't touch on that? Why was that done? Fi for for oh, financial, financial financial reasons. Mm -hmm. Reasons of let's let's say reasons of cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and also there's a communication issue as well, you know, and um, having the Director General in St. Lucia meant that when there were issues, it only happened once, but there was a serious staffing issue where I was at loggerheads with a certain staff member. So he had to fly up, you know, mm -hmm. because it's DG, you know, come kind of make peace, <laughs> kind of thing, you know. So reasons of, I guess, practicality, but certainly cost effectiveness, mm -hmm. because really that allowed us to downsize the office, shall we say right size the office, mm -hmm. you know, the, the office as a whole mm -hmm. kind of thing. Plus there was sometimes confusion as to which office to treat with in regard to particular issues and so on. And uh, in any event, we, we were not getting the cooperation of the Antigua government really mm -hmm. uh, to, make us, it, to, to make us comfortable. Mm -hmm. All right. You can imagine it was a very difficult decision politically for the Antigua government. Yeah, given, given the early and disputes they, and they, about the secretariat in 81. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But to be honest, I simply just pushed it, made it happen, got the support of everybody else, all the other heads and so on. You know, I had it all that allowed being and all that to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Making it happen wasn't all that easy because there were some staffing issues as well. There were people, some staff who didn't feel satisfied with their termination benefits. You know, you know this yeah, kind of yeah. administrative things. Mm -hmm. But... Um, but it happened. But yeah, but coming back to, yeah. as you're saying, the, the, the contribution to the, what the organization is today. Yeah, I think yeah. all of these things we're talking about mm -hmm. that were done in those early years, really, I mean, were they, well, laid the foundation, mm -hmm. you know, were the stepping stones that have been trodden since, you know, to get, us, to get us where we are today. I still lament what I perceive as, I don't know, an, an insufficiency of commitment on the part the, of the, the leadership, on mm -hmm. part of leadership. I still see that. I still think that integration is in a large, in large measure a matter of expediency for the heads. I've said so mm -hmm. uh, before, before to you. But the point is we have arrived somewhere. We have an economic union and that was always part of the dream. I mean, from day one, uh, it is not functioning yet as a full-fledged economic union. There's still a lot of work to do. For example, you don't have free circulation of goods, yep. mm -hmm. you know? Which, which is critical, which frankly, if it does not happen, forget the use of the term economic union, mm -hmm. okay? And not to mention, you know, movement of persons yes, and, that, and that kind of thing. So we've, you know, we've, but I don't know, it's taken so long and it's been so hard to, it's been so hard to get, to get where we are today, but we're there. This has been the fourth program in the series, the OECS, The Founders, the story of the early years of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS, told through the memories of some of those who contributed to its founding 35 years ago. Today's program, Swinburne Lestrade. In our next program, Sir Vaughan Lewis. Because the commonality of policy had to be thought out, worked out, and decided upon at home, within the subregion, within the OECS, and not outside.